Good, good morning. Welcome, uh, welcome everybody. Um, and thank you all for joining this uh, Landor webinar on um, integrated stations and uh, how we develop those. We've um, three very interesting speakers covering a range of issues and topics around integration of stations um, that, and how we can develop and use stations as hubs to encourage public transport use. Um, a little bit of um, housekeeping and protocol. Um, we'll take questions at the end of the three presentations, but you can actually post your questions in the Q&A tab at any point during the three presentations. Um, try and, well, not try, don't, don't put questions into the chat bar. You can use that for more wider discussion, but not the questions. Um, and that just makes sure we can find them and uh, see, see what people are asking. Um, without further ado, I think uh, I'll introduce our first speaker, who's uh, Silke Kennedy-Todd from GBRTT. Um, Silke. Thanks so much, Ian. Um, so, hi, as Ian just said, I'm Silke Candy Todd, and I'm the Integrated Transport Lead in the Strategic Planning Team at uh, Great British Railways Transition Team. I'm looking at what we need to do to ensure that Great British Railways is set up from day one to support improved access to rail, in particular by other sustainable modes like buses, walking and cycling. I'll be honest, I've got a vested interest in what we're talking about today. One in five households in England and Wales don't have access to a car, and I'm in that 20%. I do a lot of hiking, um, so I rely on rail to get me to towns, villages and parkway stations right across Britain. Living in London, um, it's straightforward for me to travel to a main line station at the start of my journey. I've got a wealth of options open to me at all times of the day and night. And while I'm at those stations, I grab breakfast, I might get a picnic lunch, last minute supplies at Boots. In fact, I've worked near Waterloo Station for much of the last decade, and I've used it much more for shopping than as a place to catch trains, although, of course, do that too. But the other end of my rail journeys are often a different story. So I've arrived at or departed from countless small towns and villages or parkway stations with limited and often no onward connections to other modes, no shop, no toilet, nowhere to sit and wait out in inclement weather. Um, sometimes the station building is the only public space in the village that I'm in. Uh, often it's quite a handsome period building that's closed, but it's not hard to imagine the hub of activity it would have been a century ago, handling parcels and helping passengers. So let's now run through a few slides to give you some information about the, the context GBRTT is working on with this. So our purpose at GBRTT is to create a simpler, better railway for everyone in Britain by creating a customer centric way of thinking that puts customers at the heart of our decision making. As we talk about customers today, let's bear in mind we shouldn't only be thinking about people currently using the railway or that customer only refers to passengers. If people and goods could get to stations more easily, there are real opportunities to increase both ridership and revenue and for carrying parcels as passengers. As we can see on the next slide, um, there's some strong mm. policy context to support all of this. So the, the government's plan for rail was published two years ago this week, and it was clear about the need for rail to integrate better with other modes, something that's echoed in the UK government's policies for buses, active travel and decarbonising transport too. And the UK government isn't a lone voice on this. National Highways wants to reduce the number of cars making journeys on the strategic road network. Active Travel England wants half of all journeys in towns and cities walked or cycled by 2020. The, the Scottish and Welsh governments are both working to policies to reduce car mileage by 20%. And a lot of city transport authorities have similar ambitions. These policies are all golden opportunities for rail and for our stations. As, as we see on the next slide, rail has a vital role to play in supporting the ambitions of its stakeholders um, in integrating rail with other modes and with land use planning ambitions. This links with the five strategic objectives um, the, the UK government, and that's cross government, across departments, has set for rail that you can see on this slide. So supporting economic growth and levelling up, improving the financial and environmental sustainability of rail, and at the heart of everything, transforming the experience for our customers. The strategic objectives you can see here are supported by 15 
ambitions. Five of them are really relevant to the conversation we're going to have today. So one is meeting multi, multi meeting multimodal expectations and reducing end-to-end -end journey times, reducing total journey times and costs for transport users, contributing to long-term economic growth in areas and support of levelling up, and to the social benefits that come from improving connectivity and encouraging modal shift by increasing the attractiveness of rail. So the long-term strategy for rail, the first such strategy for rail since privatisation, will be framed by these five strategic objectives to ensure that rail set up to deliver for Britain. The integration of rail stations into both the communities they're rooted in and the wider transport network will feature in the long-term strategy and be explored in greater detail in the sub-strategies we're developing both for accessibility and for customer. As we see on the next slide, um, we supported, we're supporting the long-term strategy for rail with call for evidence that we held last year, which attracted over 300 detailed and considered responses from across the rail and wider transport sector, including local and regional bodies with responsibility for transport. What you can see on this slide are the six clearest themes that came out from those very considered responses. Um, the need for rail to have improved integration, both for passengers and freight with other modes and active travel was a key response theme. Um, within that, people talked about improvements to ticketing options, technology and modernization, the role of collaboration, all as key, along with timetable integration of other modes, such as buses and ferries and improving facilities for cycling, both at stations and on trains. Um, the response is also called out the role rail plays in facilitating better access to employment, education and social opportunities. And many felt that devolution, improved collaboration and proactive, meaningful engagement with regional and local stakeholders, including community engagement, would lead to transport schemes better positioned to respond to local needs and challenges and empowering for both local leaders and communities. It was suggested that this could help maximise the opportunity for rail to enable local regeneration too, stimulate growth and ensure long-term planning is in line with local development plans. So moving to the, the next slide, um, rail's got a really important role as a social and economic driver. Transport has the power to shape places for the better and we need to work better across the public and private sectors to help make this happen. For too long, with some notable exceptions, thinking in the rail industry has largely stopped at the station gates, but there's clearly a strong appetite to unlock rail's full economic, social and environmental potential, playing a bigger role in supporting communities. By thinking beyond the gate line and embracing the environment our stations are in, we have the opportunity to support the creation of centres of activity that will attract people to places and support economic growth and pride in place. That will bring people back to both the railway and city and town centres and our local high streets. That sounds like a win-win to me. So as we see on the next slide, I'm going to spend a, a bit of time on this one. Um, rail needs to be viewed and to see itself as an enabler and an unlocker of local and national growth and prosperity. People, including some in management positions in rail, often think of taking the train as simply getting from A to B, but actually is a vehicle, quite literally, for opportunities, jobs, education, healthcare, and social inclusion. Rail's reputation as the main artery and connector between cities is well established, but rail also has an important part to play as part of a wider integrated transport system within cities and regions. Some great work is already happening with train operating companies, local authorities and community rail partnerships across the country, but there's so much more to be done. Access to a reliable, affordable, integrated transport system opens up opportunities for society. The goal has to be to build an affordable, effective, integrated transport system that works for the people we serve. A transport system that customers can access and plan on their phones. To achieve this, the organisation and process design of Great British Railways will be crucial. And so will a shift in culture to embed thinking about how customers arrive at, use and leave stations. Great British Railways will have a clearer role in the management of the station statement than there is at present. 
um, which will facilitate integration with other modes at the station forecourt. And we expect that the passenger service contracts that will be developed will include a requirement to facilitate that integration. Rail has to be set up to play its part in a broader integrated transport system and stations as key parts of local communities. To support the ambitions of the local, regional and national transport stakeholders in the areas our stations are based in. How do we do this? Well, there are three key tasks for rail. Firstly, supporting the local ambitions and priorities of local elected leaders. So by putting strategy at the heart of our conversations, we create the ability to join up. Local, regional and national transport authorities have strategies for integrating rail with other modes to support their carbon and congestion target reductions, um, largely focused on increasing active travel and constraining car trips. So what can rail do to support that? Well, allocated space at stations for shared cycles and e-scooters, better facilities for those who walk or cycle to stations, yes. Um, working with the bus sector to integrate bus to inter better integrate timetables between bus and train. Certainly. Some people tell me it's too difficult to be done. Um, but if you look at the work of Great Western Railways, um, who've teamed up with stagecoach buses to maximise the benefits of the reopening of the Dartmoor line, that tells you another story completely. Ridership on the bus from Oakhampton to Tavistock has increased by 68% since the line reopened in late 2021, which looks like an impressive figure all round. Uh, what other opportunities? Well, making space at stations for mobility hubs, um, which might include space for car clubs at lo some locations, and to support demand responsive transport, which with the emergence of um, mobility as a service has real potential to finally take off. Why not? Understanding that cars have a role, but working with transport authorities, with Active Travel England and national highways to minimise the amount of time people spend in them and maximise the opportunities for them to access rail and use stations instead. Absolutely. Secondly, we can support regions with unlocking the development of brownfield land to support sustainable housing and commercial development. If we embrace the environment our stations are in, we have the opportunity to support the ambitions of our cities and regions in the creation of centres of activity that will attract people to places as well as economic growth and thriving place. Big or small, placemaking benefits can be felt across the country. With the UK population expected to grow by several million over the next few decades, and with a shortage of affordable housing, it's critical we get land use and transport planning working in parallel and stop building housing that comes with built-in car dependency. Mm -hmm. Thirdly, we can support integrating our ticketing systems and fares. Customers expect a, a simple, easy to use ticketing system that allows them to move from train to bus to tram in order to get from A to B. GBRTT is partnering with Manchester, the West Midlands and the West of England to bring rail to existing pay-as-you-go schemes. Finally, it's not Great British Railway Transitions team's role to create an integrated transport strategy. Our stakeholders have already got those. But as the backbone to the public transport network, rail does have a vital role to play in supporting them. And the benefits link with the five strategic objectives the government has set for rail, which I'll remind you, is supporting economic growth and levelling up, improving financial and environmental sustainability of rail, and at the heart of it all, transforming the experience of our customers. This is a landscape full of opportunity. The goals of local councils, combined authorities and the likes of Transport Scotland and Transport for Wales are also the things that will bring more and new passengers to rail services and more revenue to its coffers. Done right, there's huge potential to reduce congestion on our roads, decarbonise the wider transport network and better support the communities that stations are rooted in. The challenge is significant, but so is the prize. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Sophie. That was re really interesting. A lot of uh, interesting thoughts and uh, a lot of positivity, which I think we need. Um, we need to sort of be ambitious. Um, so thank you for that. Um, there's quite a lot of questions already come in, which we'll take later on. Um, next, we've got Matthew Ledbury, who's a policy um, and advocacy officer at Como.uk. Thank you, Matthew. 
Well, thank you very much there, Ian, and uh, a good morning to all of you. Uh, it's very nice to be here. Uh, and I'm going to spend a, a few minutes just looking at the context of rail with shared transport. Have my first slide, please. Now, for those of you who aren't familiar with Como UK, we're a charity um, that uh, exists to promote shared transport for the public good. Now, shared transport is basically those forms of transport which allow uh, individual use, but they don't require ownership. So car clubs are probably the most well-established form that people are familiar with. But more recently, bike share schemes have become very common in many English cities and around the world. And it's an area that, that's also rapidly diversifying into other forms. So um, uh, shared e-scooters are now still in trial form in many cities in England. Um, there's also the development of, of DRT, which is uh, digital demand responsive transport, uh, also lift share. Um, and in practical terms, um, mobility hubs. And this is what I'm going to be looking at a bit more in this context, because related to rail stations, they're um, very important. Now, just in terms of what we do, um, we do a mixture of stuff at Camo UK. We, we produce a lot of guidance uh, and research. We do annual reports in particular on car club use and bike share use, which um, uh, contain um, important statistical information. Uh, we also help uh, bring together uh, practitioners. So we do uh, webinars for local authorities and for operators regularly. And we also act as the accrediting body for operators in the UK. Have the next slide, please. Now, one of the reports we've um, just produced is this report on rail and shared transport integration. Um, this was uh, funded partly by Transport Scotland, so the focus is in particular on how things are north of the border, but the basic messages in it apply pretty much anywhere. Now, in terms of the um, uh, key recommendations in it, there's three that I've pulled out that I've mentioned there, and I'm going to be looking at some of this in a bit more detail. Um, but basically, the, 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 the three key points are firstly, the, the importance of actually integrating rail and shared transport uh, at all stages of, of the journey. Um, secondly, seeing shared transport as an ally of rail, not seeing it as a competitor, but seeing it as something that helps complement railways. And finally, the importance of actually taking railway stations and seeing them more as mobility hubs that bring together different forms of non-private transport. So that's shared transport and public transport and active travel um, and helps br bring them together to be a coherent um, alternative, which people can feel uh, confident as, as, as using as, as a, an effective alternative to needing to own private vehicles. Can we go on to the next slide, please? So in terms of what a mobility hub is, um, this is just a, um, a, an illustration we, we've uh, developed to give an idea of the sorts of things you might see in a, this, this would be a, uh, a mid-level um, city hub, if you like. Um, as I indicated before, it brings together shared transport, public transport and active travel, um, but it also seeks to go beyond that. It improves the, the public realm, so it becomes more of a pleasant area. Um, and it also provides um, information and facilities. So it may provide uh, work areas or cafes or even small parks, but basically become a place that's attractive in itself. Moving on, if I can. In terms of the, the types of um, hub that you can have, it, um, we've classified them into six different types. Um, at the top end, you will have um, the big city centre um, rail stations, the, the interchanges that go with that. Uh, the opposite extreme, you'll have small um, community ones, which may be not much more than a place for a, a car club and a bus stop and, and possibly a small cafe area. Um, but basically, they can be um, uh, range in, in type and content uh, quite a lot within that. And mobility hubs mo mo work most effectively when they form part of a network rather than just being sited uh, in isolation on their own. we move on. Okay, so in terms of what, what benefits um, hubs provide, um, I've touched on some of these already, but it's just worth um, uh, summarising some of them. Um, most obviously, they boost convenience for, for multimodal trips. Um, they offer the possibility of seamless switches and, in, um, and improved links between different layers of transport. Um, in terms of having everything in one place, they promote the use of, of public and shared transport over private vehicles um, because of the ease of being able to use, move from one to another. Uh, they offer a more safe and comfortable dwell time. They can provide flexible 24-hour services as, as, a, uh, as, as a, uh, a sustainable alternative 
um, to just um, being focused around the private car. And one, one issue that's valid for multimodal journeys is the importance of finding your way from one mode to the next. So a way that they should be instantly recognisable is through strong brand identity. And I'll be coming to that more um, in a moment. If I can move on, please. So in terms of what the um, success factors would, would be in, in a, with a mobility hub, um, we, we've got um, six that we list. Um, the first one is the choice of sustainable modes. Um, obviously, we're talking about rail here, so um, rail is assumed um, in these types of, of mobility hubs. Um, but given that we're looking to the future, hubs should be designed to accommodate as, as many sustainable and shared modes as practical um, and should allow for mode expansion as well. So we may have things like shared e-scooters uh, as well as bike share. Uh, cargo bike share is developing. Um, and it should also incorporate um, uh, bus and digital demand responsive um, buses. So it's not just um, a, a, a simple bus station, but one that, that's looking beyond how bus use may develop. Um, and as well, in terms of, of parking, not private parking, but uh, car club availability and car share bays with e-charging facilities as well. Um, moving on to the next one, um, visibility and inclusivity. Um, hubs need to be basically need to be um, clearly identified um, with services that can be easily accessible by, by everyone. Um, strong branding and consistency will make future hubs um, recognisable in the landscape uh, and allow people to become familiar with them. Um, the use of, of totems, um, wayfinding and information boards, um, as well as more subtle navigation aids in their design should make the places, um, should make them intuitive to use in terms of how, they can, how you can find your way around. Safety and accessibility, next factor. Um, fairly obvious in this day and age, but design and facilities should ensure user safety and accessibility. Um, design should make ensure that people feel safe by being well lit, um, encouraging um, passive surveillance through CCTV, uh, and where possible also providing um, staffed indoor locations. Moving on. Um, thank you, the e ease of switching modes. Um, the design of hubs needs to physically locate modes close together. Um, so that they should be considered um, connected with a station rather than being um, set um, some distance away on the other side of roads. Um, they need to provide clear, clear way, way, wayfinding in order to get to and from um, platforms to other, other types of modes. Uh, and also um, dig, dig, digitally, the hubs need to incorporate interactive information points to make it um, easy to, to, to plan and uh, look, uh, look forward to how journeys can be developed. Um, separate to mobility hub, but, but complementary really is the concept of mobility, mobility as a service. Um, and this should ensure that uh, information should be available on, on uh, rail operator sites um, and raise awareness of door-to-door of -door journeys that can be made um, with the options that, of um, origin and destination stations. Moving on if I can, in terms of practical facilities, um, hubs will provide more than just transport functions, so they, these ensure that mobility hubs become integral um, into the community and add genuine value and make um, dwell time a positive experience. Um, they may include things like uh, toilets, uh, baby changing, you know, fairly basic functions, um, facilities for eating and drinking, um, also things like um, water fountains, uh, vending points. Um, and practical functions to help um, enhance the journey. So it could be things like parcel lockers or phone charging points or connected work pods. And the final element is social and community appeal. So these are softer, softer elements which um, are required to add value. So basically hubs should be a, a, a pleasant and inviting environment that tie into their local community's identity. So this might be features like um, art and sculpture. Um, play functions for younger ones to build positive memories, uh, places for community interaction, um, green space, um, and possibly in some locations, facilities to allow for exercise. Um, really, it's, you know, with a bit of creativity and imagination, uh, there's, there's a lot of possibilities that can be developed here. So those are the six key factors. Um, in terms of how this might look um, in the report, um, we... Um, looked looked at how you might take a couple of different types of stations and um, reimagine them. So we took the idea of, of 
a busy um, interchange station on one hand and a uh, a more rural station on another to look at what they could look like if they're redefined as mobility hubs. If I can go to the first one. So um, this is an example of, uh, of an urban interchange um, uh, area. Um, what you can see in front of you is what would have been the car park beforehand. Um, so you can see the range of things that uh, you have there. You can see the um, cycle hub, um, which uh, has uh, shared bikes and shared e-bikes as well, um, along with a, a, a repair station. You can see a, a, a seating area in the middle. Um, you can just see on the left-hand side a cafe and working area, um, but basically a mix of alternatives in terms of, of uh, the different needs that people have in places like this. And moving on to the next one, um, this would look at a, um, a smaller area. So this is a, a more suburban one, but you can see here how the, the station buildings have been reimagined. So um, we have a shelter waiting area, fairly obvious, although you still find them uh, lacking in some stations. Uh, but you, you also have things like uh, parcel lockers. Um, you can see on the platform a couple of uh, work pods um, that are available there. Um, you can also have accessible toilets. Um, so basically, it's making the, the provision of the facilities that, that fit more the size of that particular station. So if we can move on. So as well as the um, report that we've just mentioned, um, there was another one that's uh, come out very recently that's quite relevant. This one was produced by um, England's Economic Heartland uh, and that we were one of the writers of this. This is looking at the business case guidance for mobility hubs. I recommend this for anyone who's seriously looking at developing them. It's aimed specifically to assist um, the practitioners in, in developing it by providing advice um, on the factors that you need to take into uh, account when looking to develop one. Um, I'm not going to go into the, the full detail of it, but I wanted to pull out one particular element, if I can, which is on the next slide. Um, because one of the features in this is a rural station case study. Um, and this took the concept of a station on um, the edge of a market town. Um, and we give some idea there of what the existing problems might be. So um, the lack of um, appropriate first mile and last mile services um, in particular, which makes access much harder and exacerbates social inequalities. Um, and also the fact that um, while bus services may be provided, they're often not always that um, effective um, because they don't necessarily time in with services. They don't necessarily meet the needs of people who, who want to get there. So in the block on the right hand side is, is an example of how the services that, that currently exist um, can be expanded, so you can get a sense of the, of the different features that can be uh, that, that should be looked to be added in terms of actually making this uh, an effective hub that will become more effective uh, for people to use. Can I move on, please. Now, in terms of guidance that's out there, um, there's just a, a couple of network rail ones I wanted to add for those um, who may be familiar with them. Um, these are part of a suite of documents um, that they, they produced. Um, this first one is on parking and mobility um, uh, at stations uh, and is looking at how um, access to stations is likely to change in the future. Um, so it's very much a forward-looking document. I've highlighted one of the, the quotes in there about mobility hubs. Um, uh, basically about um, seeing stations as potential hubs and how they, they can be developed um, and the need to basically um, involve the different stakeholders in, in any particular area in looking at what's um, actually needed and what's desired. So that was the, the, that's the first network rail document. The second one, which, looks, look, which does look very similar because it's all part of a, a suite of documents, um, this is on public realm design. Um, and again, it's looking to, at how to actually um, improve the um, immediate area around stations um, and makes the point about um, uh, mobility hubs being able to um, help bring these together um, and ensure that you have a, a coherent range of facilities that um, are uh, attractive for use. So if I may just move on to what I think is the last slide. Yes, the, uh, um, just to finish off, um, I've highlighted there the um, our rail report. Um, I've also put there the um, these are three mobility hub documents which can be found on our, our website 
Um, if you have a look, there's a lot of information about mobility hubs. Um, and we, we have uh, various um, guidance documents which aim to assist the different stages of, of uh, planning and developing mobility hubs. So they're all available there to, to download. So I hope you found that useful and uh, I look forward to um, uh, hearing more in the discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. That was that was also very interesting. A lot, a lot, a lot covered there, and uh, a lot of interesting ideas and uh, thinking going on in the space of how we develop stations as mobility hubs um, and uh, as part of the wider transport network. Um, our next speaker is uh, Catherine Jones from Sistra, who um, is my colleague in the fares and ticketing, and is going to discuss integrated ticketing. Thank you, Catherine. Good morning, everybody. Um, yes, we've had some, some really uh, interesting um, uh, thoughts there on kind of the, the um, infrastructure around rail stations. Uh, I want to talk a little bit more about um, the, the payment uh, and fares that, that pa form part of an integrated journey. As Ian said, I'm part of the sister team that advise our clients on um, ways to make buying and paying for public transport more simple for customers. Um, and part of that is really uh, ensuring that the kind of the integrated um, journeys that we're all trying to get people to make are something that people find that they can uh, pay for uh, and understand. So as you see on the next slide, uh, every journey has uh, a number of elements and the fewer barriers we can put between those uh, the simpler the journey becomes in people's minds and the more likely people are to consider it. We've all experienced trying to plan for an unfamiliar journey and in the end giving up because it's just too difficult. Now that might be because um, we can't find the information that we need um, or that we can't, uh, we can't work out how to get to the various modes that we need, but it's also sometimes about how we pay for everything. The more joined up and simple we can make a journey, the more attractive it becomes. And interchanges, clear signage, good facilities, websites, they're all key to this, but so is paying for it in a simple and transparent way. This becomes even more important when the journey is multi-leg or multimodal. As you see on the next slide, we don't always view the cost of things in the same way. Recently with the price of fuel, people have become much more aware of how much car travel costs, but it's still probably only thinking about the price of the petrol, and not really thinking about the cost of tax, of insurance, of maintenance, et cetera. Does anyone work out a price per mile cost for car ownership and then add that onto the price, of the price of petrol? I don't know anyone that does, but that is actually the true cost of using the car. And if we're going to get people out of their cars and onto public transport, we need to make sure that there's a, a, a way they can compare costs in a form that makes it more obvious that the cost of the public transport actually matches or beats the, the cost of private car um, travel. How we pay for our, our transport and how much it costs really does affect our decisions on how we travel. We often balance up price and convenience, and that can alter which mode we choose. But sometimes just looking at the cost of things can put us off choosing public transport altogether. And if it's a complex journey where the costs start to mount up, and each of those needs to be paid for separately, not only does it start to look overwhelming, you're trying to do that, that maths in your head and add up all the different elements of your, of your journey. It all gets a bit difficult in the end, might as well just get in the car and travel the journey simply. But as you'll see on the next slide, that doesn't have to be the case. We can make this simpler for people. London style ticketing is on lots of politicians' wish lists. Um, that's because it looks really seamless. And it's the goal for lots of the, um, the, the urban areas to have something similar but it only really works because TfL hold most of the cards and that's not the same elsewhere in the UK. They have a single back office, they control the, 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 the transport contracts, 
we need to find a way of of providing that kind of service to customers in a different different kind of city multimodal products do exist in lots of the urban areas but they tend to cater for more regular commuter style journeys or potentially you know a day out where you might be at the at, at your leisure traveling between bus train tram etc um, they don't necessarily support a local rail journey a local journey sorry to a rail station and then potentially a longer journey somewhere else as Silke was saying when she um, in her um, introduction, you know, that's the kind of journey that she does quite a lot. She'll get a local journey to a rail station and then off to elsewhere. And that's easy in London, not so easy elsewhere. Quite often, if there is a multimodal ticketing offer, it's at a premium and that premium can put people off. So they, they, the, the premium fares, they cater for whatever you're doing. They're not catering for what you're specifically doing. And ideally, there'd be a fare for every journey that someone wants to make that's specifically tailored to that journey. Um, and that should be retailed simply and conveniently. It just isn't feasible. Non-public transport users often cite the complexity of fares as a barrier to choosing transport. So increasing the number of fares certainly isn't the way forward. So if we're going to attract new users to public transport, we need to get price and simplicity right. We need to provide attractive answers that makes that not a barrier to travel. So how do we do this? Technology can help. I know there's been quite a lot of chat going on about you know, mobile phones, and whether people should be able to use them for um, public transport. Clearly, they're, they're an incredible device. You know, you've got a wealth of information on there. You can have your transport tickets on there. You can have tokens on there. But it's not for everybody. But the way we price journeys um, means that we can use technology uh, behind the scenes to make things simpler for people. And Sistra are doing quite a lot of thinking at the moment about things like distance-based fares. Each mode might be differently priced and they don't have to be the same price per kilometre, but it can make fares more equitable and easier for people to understand. A lot of our um, uh, fares currently are quite historic and they don't always make sense. And when you actually compare the cost of uh, a bus journey or a rail journey on its miles, it's price per kilometre. There's not always a really good logic why that's the case. And again, you know, people do notice this and that puts them off. We're also, um, we also do need to consider the, you know, the technology that's in people's hands. People can use their phones and we can track those, those journeys that they make just from their mobile phones and use that as a way of building the journey and the fares that go with it. Uh, it's it's not for everybody, but it is something that makes it really simple for people. And if all the infrastructure that people use when they're traveling can recognize them as the same passenger, then systems behind the scenes can build up their fare for that particular journey that they are making and charge them the price that they should be paying for it. This all comes down to um, what we call account based ticketing. So people can choose the token that they want to use to, to make the systems recognize their travel. So it could be their mobile phone, but it could also be their bank card or a, a smart card that they've chosen to use specifically for travel, like an Oyster card. It could even be a QR code that they've got on a piece of paper. It's a token and it's their token, which, which it, it identifies them throughout the journey then they can travel. If that token travels with them and is recognized in all the stages of their journey, they don't have to choose the product that they think might give them the best value for their journey. They don't have to try and make that calculation. The system can do it for them. They can just travel and the system will work out what the fare should be. And all of those, the fares for all of those different legs of that journey can be calculated together and paid for in one payment. 
that takes the stress away from, from the passenger. We use it as systems and the technology we've got to make sure that they're paying the right price. However, it's not just enough to say, we're going to give you the right price. They have to, we have to earn their trust. If they can't see the price of the ticket because it's on the ticket, we have to make sure that we give them ways to find out what they're being charged and allow them to, to understand the cost of that journey, how it was made, made up, and where there are savings, where, what those savings were. It can't just be the right price. They have to be able to see it's the right price and to be able to understand the calculations that the system has made. So that user interface is really important. You know, it, it's generally an online facility, but it can be a website. It could be a, a running tally on their phone. It has to be something that allows them to see those calculations. Once we've earned their trust, they'll probably not think about it. How many of us have traveled around London, especially if we do it frequently, probably never check what we've been charged. We know the system can do it for us and it'll know better than us what the best price for that, that travel would have been. ABT can also cope with things like micromobility. There's been a lot of discussion in the earlier um, presentations about you know, mobility hubs, the need to, to integrate things like e-bikes and e-scooters, car clubs, all of those kind of things. And, it, and ABT can do that for us. The different mobilities might be charged differently. So you might pay you know, per minute for your bike hire. That's fine. The system can cope with that and you might pay, you might pay per mile for your your rail journey if it's a, a, a distance based journey or you might pay a traditional fare all of those can be pulled together behind the scenes and then the system can take one payment from you so you just make the journey the way that suits you best it gives people the opportunity to be flexible they can try something out without having necessarily to commit to it ABT can also support discounts. It can do discounts for combined you know, journey legs. So a bus to the station, then a, a rail journey onwards. And that logic can be really powerful in trying to get people to consider modal switch. If we can reward people for, for taking uh, a, a, a public transport journey or a, a, an e-bike to the station rather than driving and parking, then we can potentially use that to persuade them to try it out. So if you if you can if we can offer people, you know, 10% discount, whatever the discount is, in you know, if they choose to travel not by their car, leave their car at home. And that really ties into you know the, the opportunities to make the places they're going to, you know, somewhere where they would want to go, a micro a mobility hub you know, the station as a place in itself where there is a cafe. So once they've cycled, they can get themselves a cup of coffee, get on the train. It's all part of making integrated transport um, more attractive and allowing people to, to have a real choice not to get in their car um, and, and to make the journey actually an enjoyable experience. ABT can even flex for things like events. So if you've got a large event in um, uh, a town or city, then, you know, that can be the advertising for that can get people to use public transport if it's made attractive and there's an easy way of paying for it. Overall, reducing the complexity of fares and payment can support better integration and it needs to be part of the thinking for integrated transport. It's not enough to have a fantastic station or a really attractive mobility hub if it's still really complex to pay for everything. We can get people to change their behavior by making everything joined up and integrated fares and ticketing is all part of that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. <laughs> I think we've had uh, three very interesting and in presentations there from uh, uh, three presenters. And we've had a huge amount of chat and a lot of questions come in. Um, I think uh, what we now need to do is, is open it up and, uh, and tackle some of these, these many questions which have, which have arisen. Um, in terms of, I think uh, 
the, the one which uh, strikes me most as perhaps what well, is integration everything costs money and integration is no different to that fares ticketing money is always at the heart of um, decision making and uh, where do, where do the uh, where, where do we think this money is going to come from is it from the passenger or is it from from um, the public purse um, Perhaps, uh, I'm not sure who to put that one to in the first instance, <laughs> really. I think uh, it could apply to it. Um, Silke, do you have a thought? Yes, I do. I mean, it, it, it's a great question. There's obviously um, a limited pool of um, funding available when you think about funding through the classic sort of rail avenues. Um, but as we can see with what's happening in, in Manchester and Birmingham and the trailblazer deals, um, we shouldn't just be looking in terms of funding from the DFT for that. So first of all, I think, you know, rail is need, is, is need to be working in, in partnership with its partners in transport bodies, um, with, with the likes of, you've got, you've got options around land value capture, for example. There's all sorts of things where there's potential, much broader potential for funding. Um, then, then sort of perhaps people would traditionally be thinking of. And so that's why one of the things that's so very important as we move towards sort of this, this new future for the railway and for rail stations is about those collaborative working relationships with partners and how people can work together much more closely um, on joint funding bids, on looking at different streams and pulling that together. And that could be, you know, I think one of the things that's really important is actually about how you're sharing information with partners um, about what plans are for stations. So master plans for a station, for example, from it, it, it would appear that, that people aren't necessarily all working from the same information in the first place. And sometimes you get situations where things can get quite advanced for, for example, something like a new cycle parking facility at a station, but people haven't understood that there's actually other plans locally about what wants to be done there. So I think key to all of this funding the root of it is about the those core relationships that that people have to have in in partnership with one another so the train operating companies the what will be great british railways um and the the, the local authorities um is is really key there and making sure they've got joint information and then that look looking at what those funding opportunities are now obviously you know a, a lot of work gets done um, with section 106 funding particularly in london and i was working i worked transport for london for a long time um but but land value capture is is something that's that's really important as well and obviously that's not coming from the public purse thank you uh, Matthew, um, a lot of um, the, um, the the ideas of what stations should look like uh, come from work that you're doing. What do you think about uh, this whole cost issue? Well, obviously, cost is always a, a, a perennial problem in terms of where you get funding from. And I, I think Silke made some good points about some of the, the ideas out, out there that you can look to, to seek to um uh, seek funding from uh, uh, in terms of um, of development of of um hubs that are going on at the moment there's been various funds that the dft has created um which have been uh, possible sources um for funding and th these come up periodically i think one of the the more interesting thing, things that may develop is the the concept of reviving uh, local transport plans and the guidance of that will hopefully come out for uh, public consultation very soon but what i hope we will see uh, more there is a sense that funding from government will be for those um, plans which are good plans which actually look to to join things up properly and have a coherent approach to transport in an area rather than what we've um, generally seen for a long time which tends to be um, thematic funds with people having to bid in in order to meet the terms of that fund so that's one possible shift which i think can help um and a smaller one i think it's worth bearing in mind as well with um the, the hubs idea is always to look at revenue funding as well as capital funding and if you're trying to turn places into a, a, attractive um, uh, areas to be, they then become more attractive from a business point of view. So it's easy to, to actually have um, businesses of various times actually based there, and it provides an income which can be, then be used to help maintain and develop the hub over a period of time. 
So that, that that's that's um, um, some some other possibilities, but it, it's it's a very big issue, and and um, I'm, I'm sure there's plenty of other ideas people may have as well. Catherine, uh, yeah, I think I agree with with Matthew. That, you know, the, the making this, the stations and the, the environments around them uh, attractive to, to businesses to be there is one way of funding the infrastructure. I mean, certainly, you know, the the asking passengers to pay for it is is not sustainable it's in, you know it, it costs enough anyway to, to pay for the journey not the infrastructure that they're passing through as they go as they get to their journeys um but they have to be um they, they have to be somewhere that people want to go uh at, in order to sustain those businesses that potentially will provide some of that revenue stream thank you the <clears throat> There's been a lot of chats and questions around how we compare to Europe and uh, do we do it better or what, what's our, how do we measure against it and what's our uh, context against the European market? Um, how, how do you feel about that? Um, it's Catherine, uh, you've, you've recently been to Germany, I know that. How do you measure the German public transport network against uh, how we do it here in integration? It is it is difficult, you know, it, there's there is a perception that, you know, the Europeans have held on to uh, a much more integrated uh, approach to transport. And, you know, that that is very much the has always been the case. You know, my experience from, uh, living and working in Germany is that, you know, you the the the, the buses get you to the station, the trains leave on time. You know, everything is in order. I have to say that's perhaps not quite as true as it used to be. Um, Certainly, I think the the in Germany um, they are struggling, uh, as as a lot of areas are now, uh, to keep that um, the the frequency of journeys up and the the integration. Um, but but you know we aren't in that position in the UK, and you know it's all very well looking to Germany or elsewhere in Europe to say you know wouldn't it be nice if I think we have to work from the position that we're in and try and improve what we've got uh, under the legislation that we all have to work under. Um, and, you know, the, if there are incremental changes that we can make that start to improve things, um, you know, there, there can be a, you know, a, a gradual improvement. I don't think, you know, staring at the, 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 the you know, the, 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 the Swiss network of, of, of transport and going, why don't we have that? You know, we haven't got it. We need to work from where we are. Thank you. Matthew? Well, I'll take this in two parts. Um, the, the first bit in terms of uh, good examples elsewhere, um, certainly for, for mobility hubs, I, I would suggest um, parts of Germany. There's been some very, very good developments, Bremen being a particular example. Um, so you, you do get good examples uh, on the continent of, of where they have been developed better. Um, the, the second part, I think, it, it, is, is this key issue about how we approach transport, because the problem we've had in, this Brit in, in, in Britain for the last... 20, 30 years or more, actually, is the problem of fragmentation and the fact that responsibilities have been um, split up and trying to find out where accountability and coordination properly lies is, is a challenging task at times. Um, and obviously, this is true partly um, in the, the rail sector specifically, but also with transport um, generally. So uh, we, we still lack um, uh, far too much um, proper transport authorities that have you know, strong strong powers with the ability to to join up to regulate to fund, um, similar to what you'll find in many uh, cities um, around the world, so certainly in mainland Europe. I think the moves we're seeing in this country with city regions and the the powers that are being given more to mayors do that sort of thing is is a positive step forward. But I think for a lot of these changes, if we're going to see um, the shift that's significant rather than just incremental, then there needs to be a sense of um, giving power back locally and creating um, authorities or empowering um, elected individuals to actually have the ability and, and the, the, the funding and the power to, to make these decisions and make things happen. Because a lot of the time, it's as anyone involved in it knows, you, you're, you're trying to pull together the, this group of, of organisations. And if some of them aren't particularly interested, it can become um, much, much harder. And in some cases, just, just make plans completely unworkable. Thank you. Silke? Thoughts? Yeah. Uh, yes, I thought, thoughts, many, <laughs> many, um, uh, a, 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 a number of which have been covered admirably already by uh, Matthew and Catherine. Um, 
it's interesting that this point that Matthew just talked about in terms of um, giving power back locally, that's obviously fundamental to what's being talked about with future Great British Railways. You know, there will be a pretty lean core for Great British Railways, and then a lot of it is going to be um, at, at the local level. And <clears throat> I had I, I mentioned earlier um, about the work that uh, Great Western Railway are, are doing down um, in, in, in Devon on the Dartmoor line. And actually, I was speaking to their integrated transport manager yesterday. Um, I'm, a, I'm a real fan of what, what they've been doing down there. And uh, he, he said, you know, they're able to make these decisions locally at the ground because they know, for example, that the, the local bus company is about to look at a, a timetable change. They're due for a timetable change. So having that knowledge on the ground and being able to have those conversations to actually look at timetables to either link them in better with the train timetable or to even um, convince the bus company to reroute their services so they start serving the um, train station which is certainly what they've done in a couple of their routes down in um, the um, southwest can can be um, really powerful so so that 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 point is really important and that's something we're definitely going to see under great british railways is much more sort of local um, ability to move and respond to things um, and staying with the point about uh, great western railway the other thing they've done really effectively and i'm not saying other train companies haven't done this but i'm saying that perhaps my linkedin has just been at coincidentally full of people praising what um, they've been doing but they they've they were very quick when the two pound bus fare came in to get a marketing campaign out advertising the two pound bus fares um, because I think they could see the opportunity there was there to encourage people to switch away from the car to, to, to that mixture of uh, bus and train travel. And they've really gone great guns with that. And I think, again, at a local level, doing things like that is really important. Obviously, what we've seen in Germany is we've seen the introduction of this. Is it a 48 euro flat? fair for public transport um, um, for, for a month which sitting here in the UK we think is brilliant but I have seen people in Germany being critical of it for, for you know various different reasons because we're never happy it's the same you know I'm an avid cyclist so I, I follow um, the discussions around cycle rail integration and cycling in, in um, um, Holland avidly uh, so we all look, the rest of the world looks at Holland and goes, isn't that amazing? But in Holland, people complain because there's still things they're not getting and not seeing. You know, it's it's what base that you're you're starting from. But I did I, I did really welcome the, the, the decision on the two pound bus fares. I, I think there are real opportunities for rail and for getting people to stations there. Um, it's great that it's been extended yet again um, and that then it, uh, uh, from November it would be two pound fifty. I think that's that's really um, positive. And I also think there was a question in the chat about has Silke been hiking in Switzerland? No, I haven't. I haven't been hiking in Switzerland. Um, but I do a lot of hiking in Spain and um, that the, the transport integration that, that you talk of, um, I can I can promise you um, in in rural Spain is is not of, of a high standard. Um, it's, it feels quite similar to the, the UK at times. So I think we're all on a learning journey together. Um, but absolutely, there is that there, there is a lot we can learn. Um, from Europe but we mustn't forget as well that we get um, Americans for example come here and think that our, our public transport system is amazing. <laughs> Thank you. Um, the other area which has recurred a lot in the questions and the discussions is the role of car parking at stations and I'll, I'll come to you in a moment Silke because I think it probably touches on you. I think there's a lot of thought about Car parking stations, we, do we need it? Don't we need it? And uh, just speaking from my own personal experience at a, a small rural station, which has a small car park, it was the key factor when that railway reopened in the Scottish borders to actually getting a lot of people in because it's a rural area and there is no accessibility. So I, the station car park was instrumental in getting demand on the railway, but that's not a universally held view. And I didn't see that from the questions. What do, you, what do our panelists think? Silke, we'll, we'll start with you since you're, you're there. 
I do, I do, I do have views on this. So actually, I'm, I'm now going to promote someone else's fantastic work, um, which is the work that the deputy CEO of Sustrans, John Lauder, has been doing up in um, Scotland over the last year, and he's seconded full time into Network Rail um, Scotland, so Scotland's Railway, and he's been working very closely with. Um, both Scott Rail and with Scottish Government on the development of a really great um, strategy called uh, Sustainable Travel to Station Strategy, um, which I believe is due to get published at some point next month. I urge everyone on this call when it's published to read it. It's a it's a real manifesto um, for for change. Now, obviously, in Scotland, they've got some really strong levers that they're working with there. They've got that target of a twenty percent reduction in in car mileage. And they've also, um, you know, they've, they've also got a commitment in terms of that 10% of transport funding um, going on, on sort of that shift away from cars, which I think is really positive. However, I think there's going to be a lot that we will be able to learn um, about um, rail travel and about stations from the, the strategy and from the delivery plan that's being developed that to to basically roll out that strategy in real time and one of the things that really struck me about what you said Ian was um, you talked about the car parking um, on the borders of Scotland and what John would say is and he is Scottish is that um, free car parking at stations in Scotland hasn't done anything to shift the dial in terms of getting more people onto trains in Scotland so they're very focused at what you do to um, improve sustainable access to, to stations you know with a particular emphasis on walking cycling local buses um, and that has got to be and I've seen some I've seen some things in the chat about 20 mile per hour zones and the like and and that is that that's absolutely true and it comes back to this point I made earlier about the importance of of those strong relationships you have to have at almost that hyper local level with the local transport authorities because if you have got 20 mile per hour um, zones around stations and people are going to feel that they've got a, a a route to a station that they can ride or walk where they you know because it is a relatively short journey where they don't feel they're taking their lives in their hands um, and it that, that is something that's really going to encourage um, people to come to our stations and to, to um, um, ride, our, ride the trains. Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, I think um, it, it was probably understandable that, that uh, the, the disappearance of, of freight facilities at stations um, coincided with when car growth began to really take off. So it was an obvious shift to take the land that was often being used for rail freight and give it over to, to parking. Um, I, I don't think anyone's suggesting that we should get rid of private parking um, completely at stations, but the, the trouble is at the moment is if you have a, a system whereby the only, only means of practically getting to the station in many cases is by car, you're just locking in car dependence. Uh, and if you're going to have a serious shift um, uh, a, a way to, tr to to have a have a more less carbon intensive uh, transport system, then um, moving away from this idea of land at stations being predominantly there for, for car use is one of the things that has to change. So in terms of, of mobility hubs, as I showed in the presentation, it's often a question of taking the land at the moment that is the, these vast car parks and looking at how, how effectively you could use it in many other ways. And there are, are, are lots of possibilities. Now, I know from, from the rail operator's point of view, um, the car parks can be attractive because they can be an easy source of revenue. But we have to look look beyond this at what the, the, the wider goals are here. And the simple fact is, is we have large chunks of land which could be repurposed in lo lots of different ways that meets the new priorities um, that we now have. And I think that has to be an acceptance that, that vast areas for, for car parking at station will in time um, be a thing of the past. Catherine? I think you know, there is... As you, Matt, you said, there is always going to be a need for some parking in some stations in some areas. Um, and I think, you know, the, there has to be uh, a recognition that, in particularly in some rural areas, there just is not the, the local infrastructure to, for people to make journeys to stations in, in many other ways. And, you know, if there were more local taxis, maybe that might be an answer. Being able to pay for that local taxi as part of your overall journey would be attractive as would you know, being able to pay for your bike hire if that's what you're choosing. 
But I do think there are um, that you know we need we need to look at this in the round. So in in uh, urban areas, you know, if there is any car parking that needs to be charged for, and again that can be paid for as part of your overall journey. Um, but but much more those those urban areas need to encourage um, active travel or shared travel. Um, but we can't put people off actually getting to the train station altogether. And if, if that is your only way of doing it, then, you know, if there are local car share schemes that can be set up or shared ride, that can improve at least the, the uh, a drop in the, the number of cars that are needed. Um, but we have to accept that, there, that are, there are different journeys as well. So if you're commuting, you know, you've got very light luggage. If you're traveling a long distance from a rail station and you've got a large case, no way you're doing it on an e-bike so there has to be a recognition that there there needs to be a mix of of ways of getting to the station but there needs to be a, a, a way of deterring people to just pop in their cars and get there uh, and, and charging for them is one way but that charge shouldn't necessarily just go into the pockets of the people that own the car park you know if there, if that if there's a car park there the revenue from it should be reused to encourage um, you know to be pay, put back into the the, the local realm or into subsidizing um, facilities for customers. So there's a, you know, there's a, at least some benefit from, from the, the cost of that, of that car parking, not just. Thank you. Um, another question which, re which runs through many of the sort of the discussion and the questions is, is the the ease with which we can integrate this whole issue of timetabling between bus and rail um, and connections. And I, I know from experience of work we've been doing in Wales um, to integrate um, bus services at um, Carmarthen onto the Trouse Cymru network, that it's actually quite difficult. Rail has very, very structured approaches to ticket to timetabling and ticketing. And bus is in a deregulated environment where even under government control, we, it's challenging. We need to make it easier to do, in, do integration between bus and rail and through ticketing. Um, what are the, uh, legislation is always the end lever, but actually we need to be able to do it sooner than legislation permits. Um, what, what do the panelists think about that? Uh, Catherine? I think, you know, Silke, um, uh, has cited, you know, examples of um, transport operators, you know, working together to um, to integrate their services. That discussion needs to to extend to um, what's possible with integrated fares. And clearly, there are there is legislation, um, particularly in, the, in in England, that prevents some of those conversations happening uh, alone. Uh, so the local authorities have a real um, part to play, I think, in in facilitating the discussions that, that need to take place um, to provide customers with, um, with integrated ticketing or integrated fares. So it's, it's, uh, it is possible uh, and we've seen really good examples of it, um, but it's not, a, it's not a conversation that can be had necessarily by the operators between themselves without, um, without some local authority um, in, intervention. And that needs to be something that the local authorities feel that they they own as a role. Um, they need to be encouraged to do that, so that the the um, the, the local answers are are discussed and decided upon in a local environment. Silke, um, it's it's interesting actually because obviously there's you know there's discussions about legislation and we 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 don't know at the moment um, if if the legislation that will lead to the creation of Great British Railways will be in the next parliamentary session or not. However, um, reform around there's quite a lot of work we're doing at, at GBRTT and the transition team for GBR that's not reliant on um, legislation um, and that includes. Um, fares ticketing and retail reform um, and that's evidenced by the work that we're doing with uh, the west of England and with Manchester and in the Midlands where we're, where we're um, working with them on the rollout of um, further pay-as-you-go ticketing options so there is there are things that can be done and that are being done now to address this. 
Thank you. Matthew? Yeah, I, I think, I mean, firstly, I've mentioned what, what, what I said before about the need for um, uh, local authorities or transport authorities that have the power to coordinate um, this. I think part of the problem for a long time has been the the culture that's been generated where all, all transport companies are, are expected almost to see themselves as being in competition with each other um, when there's a lot more to be, ben, be benefited from from actively cooperating and joining up together. It's just, um, you know, frustra frustrating and ultimately counterproductive when they pull themselves out of agreements with each other because they think there might be um, some commercial value in, in doing that. So I think that's that's certainly one area that, that needs to be shifted and that's where a, a, an empowered local authority can help um the second one it, 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 I will go which i'd mentioned though is is um not to get fixated on this idea of, of it just being buses and trains coming something because this is where i come in from a shared transport point of view the fact is public transport can do some things very well other things it can't do so well and what we need to expect need to recognize is that people's people's lives and people's travel patterns are infinitely complicated and they need a variety of different means of being able to get around so so for many people, being able to have access to a um, a shared bike or a shared car is probably more useful than it might be to than, than to actually have a, a a bus service which ran more frequently or ran a bit nearer their house. So it's it's ensuring that you have these different uh, facilities and different modes um, available and that you can move easily from one to another and it's fitted in. But let, let's not get um, over focused on it just being a sort of traditional um, improving bus and train because important though that is um, it's now far more complicated and varied than that. Thank you. Um, we've got, sorry I've, I've lost all my questions so they, they, they dropped out so I only see the last three questions um, so I'm picking through the actual uh, the, the, the chat to sort of identify things all of a sudden. Um, I think one of the things is, is stations and land use um, Land, the, the station environment and actually how do we make better use of the infrastructure at stations again local experience here in the borders we have as a community taken on our station building and are using it now to as a, as a hub for the for our village with the, with a cycle uh, facility within it how do we make more of that across the um, united kingdom to actually in fund that it was a uphill struggle to fund it it took a lot of work and whilst the railway was very supportive it was bound by its own structures in how much it could help so how do we improve upon that That's probably Matthew um I think you might know better than me actually in that respect Ian given the work you, you've done up there um but um well, a couple of thoughts that, that, that come to mind. I think, for, firstly, part of, the, part of the problem was for a long time, um, particularly rail infrastructure was just seen as, as a cost. You know, certainly in the, in the old days of, of British Rail, demolishing stations was seen seeing as, a, as a perfectly rational thing to do because it was just buildings that they considered redundant. Um, which, which uh, by getting rid of them, they then have, didn't have to worry about um, servicing in any way. Um, but of course, that just re reduces it to a sort of horrible, bleak area that no one would would rightly want want to go to. Um, I think what you need to do is to, is to is to have this change where you start to see the potential of an area. And I think um, whoever is the owner of the the, the station uh, site or the station buildings needs bas basically to to work. It's, it's a bit of a cliche, but work properly with the community. Basically, say to people, what sort of things do you want to see here? Because people, there's lots of ideas out there, and you, you have particular demands um, based around what the uh, the patterns of the users of the station might be, or what the particular area may have in terms of the type type of people who live there. But there's no there's no shortage of ideas that people come forward. And I think once once you do that, then you start to um, you should start working through them and working out which are the most viable ones, or which ones need support from other organisations or whatever. But it's see the potential. Uh, and and look to move it forward rather than just seeing it as um, uh, a a problem that's too difficult to deal with, as is um, too often the case. There there is there is, there is a lot of potential here, I think, and it, and it's sad to see it going to waste. Silke, this is probably a question most suited to you. And how how do GBRTT plan to in this area? So I. I, uh, I, I, I really support what um, Matthew just said. Um, so rather than what GBRTT plan in this area, what I would say is 
Um, you know, it's, it's going back to this point about we want the new organisation to be much more locally based, to be much more, you know, you've got people that are really hyper local on the ground that really understand the needs of local communities. Now, you know, as I said, when I when I when I spoke, we're looking at the organisation process design and the culture of the new organisation so that we do really want people thinking about people's end to end journeys. Um, and that includes the station experience rather than rather than sort of just the, the, the station to station bit. Um, and what I'll say is what I talked about the call for evidence that we did in support of the long term strategy for rail earlier, and we had um, some very good responses um, and you know really passionate responses about this exactly this point about how you're using these stations, particularly perhaps in the um, the more rural areas or where the stations are a little bit more out of town because there is so much potential for their, there for them to act as community hubs in places where a lot of the time there isn't anything else and I've certainly had experiences particularly in the north of England where um, I've turned up at a station and there's been with the local community with the wonderful work of community um, rail partnerships that are happening up and down the country where this great community cafe has been opened or I, I, I saw examples in the call for evidence responses about how they could be used as as hubs work hubs there's the, 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 you know, like all sorts of opportunities but I think this routing of stations in the local community is really important and that means it's actually more about what the local community identifies it needs and then making sure that Great British Railways is set up as an organisation to work with the local authority and with these community rail partnerships to help facilitate that because they will the people on the ground are the people that will have the best idea about what's actually needed but the other thing I'll say is and I, I touched on this briefly earlier and I know it's been mentioned in the, the chat that we haven't talked about freight I'm really excited by the opportunity that there is in terms of freight and um, the, you know, the, the, that it isn't just about modal integration as far as passengers are concerned, it's also about freight. And I do think it's almost going, it's almost, it's almost going back to the past, but what you're seeing now is we're seeing some really interesting examples of express freight where people were carrying um, freight on a, a, a a train that's in customer service but where outside of the sort of the you know sort of peak hours carriages are being given over to the carrying of express freight and I think there's a really interesting opportunity there I think that when we moved away from from that as the sort of the car revolution really took off we we lost something that was actually really important and I do think there's a interesting role there that you could have for stations to once again also be a place where um they, they could act as, as holding, you know, they could hold freight in some way that, you know, this is all very early days and needs to be looked at, but it's, it's, it's um, something that absolutely needs to be considered. Just, just picking up on sort of something you raised there, the idea of how staffing at stations, um, obviously most stations are unstaffed now, but vandalism, safety, et cetera, and the role of staff in stations. So is this specifically on the freight point or just generally? Well, I think generally, I think if freight, yeah. is, an, if freight is to be there, there is a handling question. But one of the things we all hear is, is that people feel unsafe on stations at, at night or because they've become unstaffed and a huge reliance on CCTV. But is there any thought around the costs of how staff versus the more modern approaches play against each other? Yeah, I think that's a, a, a great question. Also, a, a, a one that a one that's um, you know <laughs> um, a bit of a minefield to to negotiate. Um, but certainly, in terms of I was, you know, in, in terms of what happens in the future with, for example, ticket offices, um, we know that you know we are absolutely clear that there needs to be service oriented staff in in stations that can still support people to purchase tickets. However, Everyone on this call also knows that there are small there are small stations in very rural locations up and down the country that aren't staffed. And I'm certainly not on this call um, making any claims for any differences we're going to make there. What I will say is that everything's being looked at. Um, that we're very clear at 
Great British Railways transition team on the fact that the customer experience has to absolutely be at the core of the thinking of the railway as we move forward to the future. And that, that is one of the questions that needs to be um, carefully looked at and considered. That, that very neatly leads us on to another question which has cropped up quite a lot in the discussion, is around the use of technology as a means of delivering integration. And we have uh, the concept of MAS, we have Catherine talking about account-based ticketing on your mobile phone. And um, there are many, many things where we are de becoming dependent upon technology to deliver our aspirations and is that a good thing or a bad thing? I know from the chat that there are a range of views on this. Um, happy for you to go first, Silke, or I could ask Catherine, who's had a little break there. I'm happy to, to pick this up. I think you know we, we can't um, we can't get away from the fact that that technology is all around us, and we should be making the best use of it. But we can't leave people behind. Um, and you know, as I said in my presentation, you know. Integrated ticketing doesn't need a mobile phone. It can, it can work from another token. So it's not essential that we force everybody into technology, but I do think we need to make technology as simple as possible for people to use. So, all right, if you've, if you've got a mobile phone and you're, you know, you're used to using it, then you know, all of the information from all of the world is at your fingertips. But if you're not, being able to, be able to speak to somebody is equally as important. And yes, there's always a cost having somebody there just to deal with people. But if we can make those people that are at the stations, the staff that are there, knowledgeable and uh, adaptable. So they are not necessarily sat behind a ticket desk selling tickets. They are potentially out on the station, um, you know, helping customers with inquiries, potentially selling tickets from, a, you know, a handheld device or pointing people to a, a ticket machine and helping them with it then you're getting you know a lot of a lot of value from from a, a member of staff there and making people feel safe on the stations so <clears throat> but technology you know the technology that that is behind the scenes is really important so you know we're all you know we all really value things like you know um uh, live information feeds on you know times of trains or buses, that kind of thing, that, that real-time information, you know, that's all driven by technology. If that technology can be can get it right, then that can really make a difference to uh, a journey. If you know that when you get to the bus stop, the bus is, is coming, but it's five minutes late, you relax. If you don't know whether you've missed that bus because there's no information or the information is incorrect, then that's a stressful start to your journey before you even try and get, uh, you know, to interchange onto a train. Um, so I think, you know, the, there's the, the we need we, the local transport authorities, but uh, transport operators, um, you know, government. We've uh, uh, you know there's an opportunity to make sure that the behind the scenes technology really supports all customers, and then there is a you know the opportunity more locally to provide face to face support when it's needed, um, in the most cost effective way. Thank you, Matthew. Well, I think technology is is one of those things that you know has huge capabilities. We we, we should never be you know blind to the fact that um, it's not a panacea for everything, um, and you shouldn't become over dependent on it. Um, but that said, I mean certainly looking at it from from a shared transport point of view, um, technology is you know hugely beneficial beneficial, and the fact that um, through um, smartphones in particular, you can do pretty much all, all the all the booking you need. Um, is is a major driver in being able to take them forward. And smartphone penetration, I think, is now at about 90% in the population, um, which is amazingly quick when you, when you think about it. But of course, it still means there are 10% of people who don't. So what you shouldn't have is end up with a situation that you end up being um, totally reliant on it. So people who don't have it are are frozen out. So I quite be, agree with the comments about the need to, to, to have um, real people there still a lot of the time um, that, that can... Uh, uh, genuinely help but in terms of of uh, where, where things will go forward i think we have to look um at basically what what the future potentials are um mobility as a service it, it to me is has huge potential and, and it pains me that one of the problems we've had in this country is that is that we've tended to be testing it out in pilot projects so you'll have a pilot project and the funding for it will finish and then the, the mass app will, will 
close until some other funding is found, is found for it. Now, if you're trying to encourage people to actually um, change their behaviour and have confidence in a new way of doing things, what you don't do is basically um, say, well, all right, well, the technology's there, but I'm afraid the funding's not, so it's not going to continue for the moment. Um, it, it's, a, it's a totally counterproductive way of doing it. So there, there, is a, there is a lot of potential, but we have to be aware of the limitations um, that go with it and manage it carefully. But I don't see any reason why these things are, are not possible. Thank you. Silke? How to build on two really strong responses. Um, <laughs> I think what I'll say is it's an interesting thing, technology. So I was, I, I've, I've lived in London for 25 years. Um, I dread the ticket machines at Waterloo Station. I, I do, and I, I use them once a month because I go down and see my mum and I did something I've never managed to do before in it with those dreaded ticket machines is I actually managed to somehow because it was so complicated buy the wrong flipping ticket to go down to my mum's um, and ended up with a ticket where I was apparently traveling via somewhere because I was just I was so bewildered as I was standing there that stress I'm sure we've all had that stress of standing by a ticket machine um, and I was I was just sort of ready to argue with a train guard if if I got called out on it for for being on the the wrong service down to down to the south coast. Um, if I'd done that transaction on my phone, it would have been so much quicker, more straightforward, and less stressful for me. So I do think some of the you know tech not tech you know technology doesn't need to be complicated and and I think this is the thing the the point that um, Matthew made around um, mobility as a service. The, the, the things that sit behind it are super complicated. It makes my head spin. But actually, the product that comes out at the end um, that we can use can make everything so simple and, and so, so easy to use. And I think really has the potential to open up a transport, which I think may be about to have its day. So demand response of transport. You know, I think there's a huge opportunity there, particularly for our rural communities. Um, where it, if it could get connected in to the journey planners of this world so people can understand what the opportunities there are for the last mile with rural rail, for rural rail with um, demand responsive transport, for example, I think it could really, it, it could take off hugely. And, and though the sort of all the data and connections behind it will all be very complicated, actually what the end user gets will be something that's, that's quite simple. And as Matthew said, there is now very large penetration of smartphones. And, and while we don't want to rely on that, um, I think what we all have to do and what we have to set up is a railway that's fit to respond to technical changes because none of us had smartphones 15, 20 years ago. And, you know, it, it's, it's being ready to adapt to what the opportunities are for improving that experience of, of travel and being at stations. That's really important. I think that's a really good point, Lucilke. I mean, um, we've been sisters working with Transport for Wales um, over the last few years on demand responsive transport for rural Wales. And the flexi service is, you know, it, it, it's, it has become really successful. Uh, and there is a flexi app and you can book your journey on that. You can also go on a website and book it on there, or you can phone someone. And um, Transport for Wales worked with uh, um, some of the community transport organisations to continue their support of local, of local um, passengers who need that support to book their journey. So the, 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 there was um, you know, a, a real kind of integration there with, with what was already existing in terms of community transport support, um, but then putting those people into to, on to demand responsive um, vehicles. So it, you know, the, the technology, controlling those vehicles and managing everything, that's, that's really clever technology. But there's also a person at the end of a, of a phone line if you need that support as potentially an elderly person or somebody with, um, you know, with uh, disabilities that needs that support. It doesn't need that. They're not they're not exclusive, they're not mutually exclusive. It can be really clever transport and still have a person that helps you with it. Thank you. And with that, I think we're just about out of time. Um, we, there, there have been so many questions and so much interesting discussion. I'm sorry if we haven't touched upon some of the themes and issues which were raised. The, the, the discussion has been, um, has been so overwhelming in, it, in its variety. So can I thank um, all three of the panellists and, uh, and Landor as well for their uh, setting this up. The um, webinar is going to be available online. The, um, 
the presentations will be available to everyone who's attended and uh, thank you all so much for your participation.